Welcome to this episode of the TelePT Connections Podcast. This week, Adrian and I are joined by none other than our good friend, Mark Milligan. Dr. Mark Milligan is a board-certified, fellowship-trained orthopedic manual therapist who specializes in the intelligent prevention and treatment of all human conditions. He's a passionate change agent founding Revolution Human Physical Therapy and Education, a mobile PT and microeducation company based in Austin, Texas. He created Anywhere Healthcare, an all-inclusive telehealth platform in 2017, and he is the director of physical therapy for Vori Health, the new virtual and in-person musculoskeletal health company on a mission to empower humanity to lead a healthier life. Mark also is passionate about population health and governmental affairs and is an active member of the APTA, AAO, MPT, the TPTA, and he educates and engages on those topics internationally. No one knows more about telehealth PT than Mark Milligan. If you're not yet convinced that PT can effectively be delivered remotely, I encourage you to listen to this episode of the podcast and then decide. We had a great conversation with Mark. I hope you enjoyed as much as we did. Here we go. Welcome to the TelePT Connection Podcast. Physical therapy information, innovation, and insights for patients and providers. Physical therapists and innovators Dan Seidler and Adrian Miranda will help you connect with your neuromusculoskeletal system, discussing how to care for every physical ailment they've ever seen or heard of, the latest digital health technology, and other fun stuff from their PT toolbox. Great guests, 21st century home remedies, exercise thumbs up or thumbs down. Now, here are your hosts, Dan and Adrian. All right. All right. But I do. Right. We're live. We Mark Milligan, we're live. Welcome to the TelePT Connections podcast. I'm Dan. I'm Adrian Miranda. And our guest here today is Mark Milligan. He's got so much to talk about. He wasn't even going to let us do an intro. Mark, what's up, buddy? Nothing, guys. It's great to see you. Thanks for having me here. I love the podcast you guys have been putting out. Solid. It's rocking. Appreciate thank you, you. Thank yeah. you. Thank you. We've we've been we've been holding out, waiting for uh, for this episode. You were definitely on my my short list from the beginning. I knew you had a lot of things on your plate, so uh -huh. we kind of held off for a little bit. And tell us what you've been up to. Ooh, well, I mean, as you know, telehealth in the physical therapy space is uh, it's evolving pretty rapidly. Um, I think there's there's so many layers to hit here, right? So on a professional stand, on like just an overall global view, um, telehealth in our profession has got a few things happening, right? We've got some states signing in and some payers signing in some big laws yeah. and some big initiatives to make sure it's included. Um, we've got uh, compact light, compact uh, states that are popping up everywhere. So that's pushing forward. Um, we've got Practice Acts Arizona just signed in. Um, the ability for PTs, or it's about to be good for PTs in Arizona to provide telehealth, which before they weren't able to. Just so not allowed. They were completely blocked. Completely from wasn't in their practice. Yeah. Right, so now, right, right, right. yeah. So Arizona, they, the governor finally got all that tied up and the legislator tied it up. And so that's actually going to be a thing to happen in the next couple of months. So it's been signed. So that's awesome. Um, uh, the only issue is that PTs aren't doing it. <laughs> So we've gone back to baseline, almost baseline numbers as an organ, as a as a profession to pre-pandemic yeah. levels of telehealth usage. What in your mind? What's what's the problem? Uh, I think there's a few issues. One is uh, I think the biggest one that people will talk about, well, really won't talk about, is payment parity and payment. Yeah. So there's been a ton of I've talked to so many PTs that we love PT, we love telehealth when it was when it's all we had. But now that we're back in business, we're pushing to go back to getting paid for it. So there's a force from big orgs yeah. to get back in person. Yeah, I think and, and they are getting paid for it now. But there's right. no guarantee that once public health emergency is over, that they will continue to get paid for it. So companies are not investing in the infrastructure. They're not going all in for that reason, I guess. Yeah, but you see states like Rhode Island's got it, got parity that's built in, yeah. right? Past yeah. pandemic, Washington State, parity past pandemic. Like there's payment parity, right? We talked about yeah. this last episode, Adrian. Yeah. Uh, payment parity, right? On. Yeah. So there's states that are adopting this, and there's yep. large payers that are adopting this, and like there's. I, I think people are sitting back on their laurels, like just saying, oh, we can get back to in-person care when there's all this other stuff going on in the telehealth space. 
Um, and they're go if they're going to be missing some boats, right? They're going to have to play yeah. catch up again on the backside. So, so in your mind, and we all we know about the benefits. Like why why do they need to be doing it? Then I, there's so many reasons, right? From a patient perspective, we need to be able to meet patients where they are. Yeah, that's it, right? Like there's if we if we take off our PT hat and we take off our kind of own bias, like we really if we if we look at and answer questions from the patient's perspective, which yeah. we should when we're evaluating them, when we're treating them, all of that stuff from a from, we should take off that hat and say, look, how would the patient want to be treated or how is the patient going to see this? We need to have our services available for them in the ways they want to be met, right? It, gone is the old way of forcing people through a funnel into your clinic. That just, that's that's going to be gone. And that's going to be gone for a lot of different services, right? Not just PT. So sure. the offering needs to be there. Even if it's 10%, 20, why would you leave 20% of your business model on the table if all you need to do is offer somebody to connect with a video visit? It doesn't right. make sense. We have to meet the patients where they want to be met. And I think that's um, the biggest thing. Secondly, they need to do it because um, of the all of the different environmental factors that can contribute to lost revenue, right? So cancellations, no shows, weather events, sick kids, you know, traffic. Uh, we, you know, Austin, Texas, New York City. Adrian, where, remind me where you are again. Yeah, I'm in Manhattan. Manhattan. Yeah, traffic <clears throat> sucks, right? Especially with the with the introduction of all these different. I think I just saw that there's a new e Uber about to happen. Electric vehicles that are, are sidestepping the New York uh, transportation laws. As though they're going to uh, they're going to start doing electric vehicles as Uber. I there. hadn't I hadn't heard that, but it was only a matter of time. Yeah. yeah. So like, <clears throat> look at traffic. Look at look, and look at availability Wait. across larger landscapes. Right. I mean, are you know, I, there's a large country out there that can people can need and use your services. So. I don't know, man. From on every level, of a, a, an organization needs to look at how pe- how telehealth and how video digital care can be integrated into that clinical pathway of that patient. Plain and simple. Um, yeah. yeah, I mean, you, you've been be- talking about this for years, and yeah. that's kind of how we met uh, at yeah. PPS a couple of years ago. Um, mm-hmm. And I, I had I had seen um, uh, some of your other presentations before that, and you know, we, we got to talking, and we've had this conversation and similar conversations, but you've definitely take it to, taken it to other levels, which, right. I mean, you're, you're pushing it on the profession, you're pushing it to the profession, you're pushing it for the profession. And I think, I mean, you, you definitely have influenced a lot of people. You've influenced me, um, and you're doing things on your own as well. Yeah. Um, I have... Go ahead. No, I was going to say on, like, I hope that I'm helping people see that there's opportunity, yeah. right? Sure. Um, from anywhere healthcare five, almost five years ago, we're about to, it's going to be super exciting where we have a, our new platform that, um, website's almost done. We're going to have a new, a new digital platform for patients and PTs and other healthcare providers to engage digitally. So that's exciting. Yeah. Um, so that's fine. That's been a long road. That's been almost a, over a little over a year since I said we needed to redo everything. It's taken a, a long, yeah. a long time. To, that sucks hard. Um, and so helping people <laughs> actually connect with patients. Digitally, is I'm super excited about. Um, you know, the PPS COVID task force is has decreed as as now no longer uh, in effect. But I'm now the chair of the PPS's payment policy committee's telehealth task force. So still working on the back end and the private practice section of how we can um, really push our profession forward and what people need to see uh, from private pra- from the private practice section. It's like people are like, why do I need it? And so we're we're creating content around the value of what uh, digital health can bring businesses, um, which I think is really powerful. Um, so what kind of, uh, with, what, kind of yeah. what kind of feedback are you getting on that? Like you're uh, it, you're, you're, you're putting. I mean, PPS put out great content. I thought from mm-hmm. from a year, you know, this time last year, I thought they were they were extremely informative. They were informed, which was like really relevant too, because there was, yeah. you know, I got I got a lot of my information directly from PPS and yeah. couldn't have done a lot of things I did without them. Um, what about now? So now you're you're building this this library of content around telehealth PT. What are private practices actually doing with it? Yeah, that's a How great are they question. To it? That's a great question. And a lot of them are really just they're they're in that waiting space. Just like all a lot of people in this country, they're like, we don't know really what to do. If we go this way, are we risking losing, you know, capital and investment and time and energy when it, when are we going to get paid for it? So like n- navigating that space and understanding 
the value. I mean, I still get emails today uh, regularly. Hey, I'm in this state. Can I treat somebody in this state? Hey, I'm I'm here. How do I get paid here? I'm like it's it's a it's a consistent theme that all the time. Yeah. Knowledge on how to how to do, perform interstate practice, how to get paid for it, and how to stay and how to document all those things are still really relevant. And so um, we're still working. We're putting together a webinar uh, for a couple of months that should have um, an idea. We're, I think we're done with the nuts and bolts of how to do telehealth. It's really the why. So um, it's going to be more surrounding kind of like the current landscape and the climate of healthcare in general and how that can apply as a, on a larger scale to us as physical therapists, but also as PTs in the healthcare space. So trying to get people really to see the value um, is it's been an interesting ride. Like it, it's, it's yeah. been, like, well, what's it going to take though? I mean, and, and I, 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 to me, I'm not trying to sell it. You know, I, I'm not trying to sell it on, I'm not trying to sell it on PTs to, to, to utilize telehealth. If, if it's right. not your thing, then, I guess you shouldn't be doing it. Uh, you know, there will be PTs who will. Yeah. And I think that there will be, uh, like you said before, the demand will be there. The, yeah. the the market will definitely demand it. And, you know, we we both know it already is. Yeah. Um, so like, what's it really going to take? I mean, to get either either the next generation of PTs or existing PTs to, to buy in a little bit more. You know, Dan, I haven't really, I mean, that's a, I love that way you phrase that and frame that question because honestly, what just came to me was really that we're, we'll probably see kind of a, a, a differentiating path. Some yeah, PTs will, will choose the kind of more digital hybrid route and some PTs and organizations will choose and bet on the, the predictable kind of permanent brick and mortar structure, right? Or somebody, a few may go that hybrid route in that middle. So yeah. who's going to do that, where they're going to do that? And how they're going to do that is, is still, I think, to be determined because like, like we've talked about, there's, there's lots of options out there and no one's really <clears throat> paving the way in a clearly defined model um, yep. that, that, that really has, has been like, whoa, what are they doing? I mean, there's people out there in the direct-to-employer space, right? Yep. But there's nobody in the direct-to-consumer space, really. I mean, right. well, not, 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 not yeah. dominating. Yeah. Right. Uh, not dominating. Yeah. yeah. I mean, there's, there's a few out there, right. I mean, but there's really, as far as a nationwide network of telehealth solutions for MSK pain, it really doesn't exist. Sure. I, th I think it will. I think you also have to consider there's other, I mean, it, if there's no money in it, you have to understand and ask why other massive players are putting in their money in it, right? Walmart, Amazon, all these people are putting their money in digital health. It's just a matter of time till they try to tackle back pain, right? Like it's, it's a no brainer. Yeah, I, I, I guess so. Um, you know, like you said before, uh, the, the, the money currently is going towards employers. Yeah. Um, and I don't know. I mean, will, will healthcare continue to be directed through employers? Um, that's a great question. You know, I guess that's, I guess there's it's one, one area to get funded, one, yeah. one area to get paid for your services. Um, Definitely. And a good way to, to funnel it, I guess. Um, I think that's just who's asking for it. You know, it's it's uh, maybe. You know, it's funny. I think a decade ago there was, are you McKenzie or Mulligan or Sarman? Now it's like, are you digital health? Are you hybrid? Or are you in person? <laughs> a great and point. So, but I, I think it really is the employers are being savvy enough to ask because they save. The consumer, I think, eventually they'll they'll ask for it because Medicare is not going to pay. Medicaid's running out. There's no money coming from the government and then whatever Medicare does, insurance companies are going to follow. So I think the time will come where consumers are going to be asking for it and they'll kind of put us to, you know, the, uh, to task. Sure. Yeah. I think there's some good assumptions there, right? I, I think that we need to, the assumption that Medicare is going to stop paying for PT and those codes, I think we need to fight that, right? I think those are, there's a modifiable like, you know, those points in history where you think you can change the future, like these are things that we can do now to, to impact the, our patients and our profession's future by changing what happens. And if we don't raise our voices, if we don't really get loud in the digital space, other people will occupy it, right? And we will be prevented from being in that space. That's true. And, and I really, from all the things that really piss me off, it's that it, it's the people that are apathetic to the digital aspect of our of our care, 
right? Like if we don't protect our rights and our scope in the digital space, it will be taken from us. And and there will be a point like in Arizona where let's say a pandemic in Arizona and PT is it's against your practice act. You can't even see a patient digitally. Every business would close, right? There wouldn't be an option, yep. right? So we have to really work hard to protect our profession from that standpoint. Ir, 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 I, mean, I was about to use the regardless. inappropriate term, irregardless. <laughs> that, that, that does not exist. Agreed. Regardless of... Uh, of all of the payment and all of the all of that stuff and business models from a pure scope of practice and a choice we have to protect ourselves as a profession right um and that's what i think is really important and yeah and do you and and you're right i mean there's there's a, assaults on our space coming from all angles right and yeah. we've talked about this before about um uh, Hinge Health and, and uh, Kaya and others that are not necessarily employing pts to do to 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 do PT care patients in 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 the musculoskeletal space where yeah. we are the where we are the experts. Yeah. Um, you mentioned Medicare. What's your sense, and what do you know that we may or may not know about uh, about I know about uh, telehealth um, being covered by Medicare following the public health no, emergency? I have no. I don't have any information on that. I know What's that the APT. I would think that it would be, it would be a really, I, I, I would, it would, once we push through this barrier and it's pushed out so long, it, it would be remiss, I think, for them to take it all away from patients. Yeah. And yeah. I think we're, we're close to seeing that year long data. You know, we're, we're about yeah. to get some Medicare data pretty soon about utilization. I have a feeling that, um, I have a feeling that we'll see the utilization data be lower than we expected. I feel like in the telehealth space, we've all done it. We know our visits tend to be shorter and we bill less when we bill insurance, yep. right? But yep. just because of how we treat people digitally. Yeah. And so I have a feeling that when we see the data, and it's my gut that when we see the data, it's going to be a very obvious, uh, effective and economical choice um, for, for Medicare to choose to have us see patients digitally. Uh, and I, and that's when we have to say, look, we're effective and we're affordable. Now we need to get paid for it the same way we would be in person. Right. So like yeah. there's an argument that our information, what we can do as providers doesn't diminish digitally. It's as effective. Sure. So combining outcomes with with your utilization data to really drive the value of what we do digitally, I think, is a solution. Yeah, definitely. Um, I, I did speak with someone recently about a, a MedPAC report, which basically recommended that that. Uh, PT, there was just like one short blurb on PT. And it was that 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 they approve it temporarily, at least uh, PTs to be Medicare providers, because of the fact that they don't have enough data. And the reason being that our the the data on PT is um is is fuzzy because of um, incident two billing, right? Meaning that there's there's a lot of PTs or some PTs or other professions that bill for physical therapy incident to physicians, which yeah, totally. I mean, that's amazing to me that that still exists. Yeah. Um, I, I suppose there are some, there are some environments or some uh, settings where it's appropriate hospitals, for example, but for the most part, particularly in private practice, it just, it befuddles me. I mean, we're, well, you know, we, we can, we can bill under our own tax ID or our own NPI. Why are we billing under a doctor's NPI? Well, there's contracted rates are different sometimes. Yeah. Right. And like, so. yeah, so there's, there's other underlying uh, things that are, that are at play there. <clears throat> so it's, it's, I, and we saw that a lot in Texas. There's a lot of uh, physician owned practices that would bill under yep. the physician and BI. So I think that uh, what will become, I think in the entire span of what you were just communicating, I think that it's important for us to remember that, if we lose our ability <clears throat> to bill in the digital space, all 9,700 codes will have to be billed instant too. Yeah. Right. Like that, that, that in and of well, that's itself. That's the confusing part in the, in the data. <clears throat> right. But what's, what's frustrating for us is it, the implications for that are massive. That yeah. means that we wouldn't be able to bill for our codes in the digital. That would, that would basically take away all access to any type of digital yeah. 
you know, we wouldn't have direct access in the digital space, even though those need those, you know, for Medicare, we still have to have a referral, but like, we wouldn't be able to see anybody. In the business. Yeah, you wouldn't be able to uh, yeah. treat patients who are covered by Medicare. Right. But at, as Adrian reminded us that, uh, you know, other payers tend to follow suit. So they, may, they may stop reimbursing PTs for those codes, right? That's so then, very possible. Yes, then we, then we're we definitely need to fight for that. You, you're, yeah. That's a great point. Yeah. So it's, it's, an, it's a really, I think, a really one of the biggest dilemmas that, that face physical therapy since direct access came to be is direct access in the digital space. Hmm. You know? Yep. Yep. Um, I, I know that, I know that the, uh, APTA is, is trying to get physical, th- get, get PTs, um, eligible through the connect act, which the connect act is, is supposed to, co- uh, continue digital health beyond the public health emergency. And my, my sense is that PTOT speech will get attached to that connect act. I hope. So, and I hope so too. I know. <laughs> For I, know. Sure. I mean, it'd be, um, a huge, it'd be a huge deal. Yeah. Um, so now you are the clinical director, the direct uh, clinical director at Vori Health. Yeah, is that the, yeah. Is that, yeah, so is that the whole the whole uh, title right there? Uh, Vori Health. So I'm the director of physical therapy and the director of clinical operations. Nice. So a couple of different titles um, as we're uh, in the early stage of startup, right? So Vori Health was born in August of last year, and um, and so we are a what they call a full stack digital health offering. Uh, we're the only one um, that in the MSK space that offers physicians, advanced practice practitioners. So um, a, uh, NPs and PAs, we have health coaches, uh, nutrition and physical therapy. So we are a point solution for MSK, um, uh, you know, pain and discomfort and conditions. Yeah. Um, and uh, yeah, it's an awesome offering because people on board, you get a visit, uh, a sequential visit with a health coach and then a physician or an APP or both and a PT um, all at once. So all in a sequential. All order. in one visit. Yeah. All in one That's visit. That's amazing. Yeah. And so cool. um, health coach really is there to help that patient identify barriers and, and really look at larger goals and, and, and ways that they can help that patient navigate. The uh, uh, MD APP team are there to really make sure that that patient is heard and make sure their medical conditions are, are uh, you know, addressed or assessed. Um, and then the PT is there to, to continue that treatment and, 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 you know, help them with their MSK and, and, and create their treatment plan. Right. Um, so it's a really awesome, awesome, powerful operate, uh, you know, a way to address people's. Yeah. Uh, uh, it sounds like it. And I, I have to imagine that one of your objectives is to, uh, control costs. Oh yeah. Right. So how are you doing that with, if you have, you know, four, professionals and a, and a power professional sort of a, a, a tech, um, at a first visit, yeah. how does that play into the, the, the cost savings? Yeah. So typically it's front loaded, right? So that visit might be initially a little bit heavy, but the overall touches and lifts throughout the entire can of plan of care are less, yeah. <clears throat> right? So that, that beautiful, the beautiful thing about, um, how that works is that the patient after that initial visit may never see that MD again, or, may never have that touch or may it may be a 15 minute follow-up or you know an image follow-up or something that is a touch but it's definitely not as heavy as an in-person visit um and we also offer a lot of asynchronous com- communication through um uploading of files and through digital communication texting we have you know so there's there's ways that you can navigate and mitigate cost over the course of that patient's engagement um, that even if that first touch is really heavy, that it's spread out over time. Right? So, so we always, we uh, patient centric care, right? Yeah. That, that's, that's what we're going for. I'm oh. picturing, I'm picturing a, now is this an in-person visit or a. This is digital. Or digital remote. Yeah, totally I'm picturing digital. exactly that. So yeah. I'm p- patient in the middle, patient in the middle and like doc, PT, OT, health coach, whoever else. Yeah. Right around that. It's like, like literally, a Brady Bunch. <laughs> Brady Bunch. Literally putting the patient in the middle. That's awesome. Yeah. Yeah. So, and it's beautiful. And we've got really positive. Our in, our net promoter score right now is 100. And so yeah, we've nice. been we've been live with patients. We're, we're live with patients in Mississippi and Tennessee. Oh, it's great. Um, Since when? Uh, for three what month is it? I, I don't even know what month it is. May. Right. So we went live with patients like three months ago. So we've been live for three months and 
Um, we have a couple of partners that we're working with in those states that, you know, identify uh, people to come on board. But right now it's, uh, we're working on the direct consumer model. Um, and that yeah. should be, we're actually direct consumer live in both Mississippi and Tennessee, but we're, we're, we're iterating different, you know, in the, in the startup world, it's, it's all about testing and then, and then, mm -hmm. Uh, assessing the results of those tests and then modifying, right? So iteration after iteration of kind of flow and plan and content and yep. all of that stuff. And so we're working out based on patient feedback, based on uh, consumer feedback, based on clinician feedback, how to best solve the solution for uh, what patients need and how to triage it, right? What yeah. if somebody comes to void and they just are worried and they just want like weight loss or smoking cessation that our health coaches can take care of? How do we just get them into that bucket and so they just see a health coach and that's okay too. So there'll be some direct consumer offering that will be um, more tailored towards what the patients want. So when you say direct to consumer, um, is that the, the marketing end of it? Is that the payment end of it? Like what, what exactly? No, so right is now, so right now it's just a, it's a patient flow model. So right now, if you're in Tennessee or Mississippi, you can go to, you can go to VoriHealth.com and download the, and then you download the app and go through the process and, and you'll be contacted by a customer service agent and they'll triage like your needs and then get you set up with your appointments. So there's actually, we're live with patients that have any type of musculoskeletal complaint in those patients, in those, in those, uh, in those, in those markets, yeah. Um, yeah. How are the patients actually finding you? Is it right now? We're website? still super sell. We're super stealth. We haven't done any. <laughs> yeah. Uh, the, our announcement of our Series A funding was the biggest publicity we've done. Other than that, yeah. it's just uh, some word of mouth things that are happening, um, and just communications uh, around. We haven't done any type of any marketing at all. Yeah. So right now we because so how are they finding you? Uh, through the website, through, you yeah. know, through, you know, LinkedIn and you know, there's a, a few uh, providers. A network of docs too. Yeah, I mean, yeah right? a few I mean, providers that have been sending us those patients as well. Because mm -hmm. some, a lot of docs in, in rural Tennessee and Mississippi, there's a, a post um, visit kind of void. If they have to travel a couple, of, there's an access yeah. issue, right? Yeah. They may have to travel a couple of hours. So they'll see a provider and we can be their uh, digital solution um, in the, in, for their patients that may not be able to get back that easily. Right. So there's been some patients through those. So it's just about uh, creating the, the awareness of our availability and what we can provide, um, and what, and how that really fits with the models that, uh, of other care providers that are out there that need it. Right. Yeah. And, and other patients really. Um, and so eventually we'll, we'll move into that kind of push the marketing push, but right now we just want, we're, we're just, we're just still creating the best product um, and still creating what makes the, the most sense for patients. You know, it takes time. Like, if you think, yeah, I mean, most big organizations, it's, it's, you don't really hear about them for a few years until they're like, Oh, now here we are, but they've been working behind the scenes. And so we're definitely as a, as an organization working hard behind the scenes, to get everything right. We don't want to screw it up. Yeah. I mean, there's one thing to say that, you know, the 80, 20 rule is you get it 80% of the way there and you launch it, but there's also that customer. Once you, if you have a bad customer experience, like it's, that's hard to overcome. Right. So we got to make sure that that's right. Sure. Did you, um, did you have a vision for this before you started with, uh, with Vori or Voya at the time? Did I, wait, what was the start? Did you have there? a vision for this? Yeah. So before my vision. My vision for Vori is a is a PT first digital hybrid model, right? Mm -hmm. Like nice. that's what it's about. It's a physical therapist practicing at the top of their license in a in a in, in as and as laws allow in a way that um, on a collaborative team that's a patient first model, right? Like that's what it's about. Um, and so we hire we, we physical therapists or our treating that's our treating person, right? We don't yeah. hire any other extenders to do that. So. Um, we, we will have, uh, PTs that deliver physical therapy care. And that's, that's definitely something that I, um, stand strong with, right? Like it's, it's, yeah. that's what it's about. It's about us doing the work and, um, that's. So that's, why, why, why PTs? I mean, besides the fact that you're a PT. Oh, because I, they're, that, that's the, in my belief, I'm biased are the best are you? providers for that type. Yeah. I don't think you're bit. biased. I think you're, you're right. Yeah. Yeah, so you're biased too. <laughs> that they're the best providers for that kind of MSK care, right? Yeah. Like, I mean, we as providers, we spend more time with patients than any other provider out there. So we, 
we and we're empathetic. We like to connect. We have a good opportunity to connect in the digital and physical space. Yep. Um, and so it just makes sense that with our knowledge and our in our doctoring profession that we we be the MSK kind of frontline providers of choice. Yep. Um, I mean, I also imagine that there's there's a a, a network built in and a, and a a process for referring out and oh yeah um, you know for P- patients that are not necessarily ready for or appropriate for PT. Totally. Oh yeah. We, we clear all red flags. We have, yep. you know, we, we have opportunities and, and availability to get people to in the, on the ground people also, um, you know, with the physicians on board, we can die, we can like triage other red flags and then, yeah. and then ultimately urgently escalate if imaging is needed, things like that. So that's the cool thing about having those other providers is that you have the opportunity to really collaborate um, across the team uh, and, and like, it's, it's awesome to hear our health coaches and our PTs talk about the successes of their patients and how they're working together to get them where they need to be. It's like, you know, if a, if a patient, if the patient needs to lose weight and they hurt moving, there's really, it's hard for that health coach to help them navigate that. But if you have a PT helping them with their pain and then they're, and then they're able to move and the health coach is in modifying their behavior and choices while the PT is getting them you know, able to actually perform the exercises needed. It's like, it's, it's a really awesome thing to see. And like patients are responding really well to that. Imagine like you have somebody. I, I that, wish, I wish I had that back in my, my private practice days. Yeah. Um, at least once a week, I would, I would get a new patient sent to me by an orthopedist who had gone to their primary care doc, who told them you need to lose weight. So right. the patient would go to the track and walk a mile. And then the next day, no matter how sore mm. they were, they'd walk a mile again. And no one told them how to exercise. No one told them what they should be eating before or after or every day in between. Yeah. And now we're treating. Shins plants and plantar fasciitis and. Exactly. Knee pain and inflamed and, meniscus and right. you name it. So, yeah. So it's a really cool opportunity. It's like, um, yeah, it really does feel different. And even though we're not together physically, it actually, the connection is really quite awesome. Mm-hmm. So, um, and patients, that. yeah, and patients are really saying positive. They're, they're reporting and patients are losing weight, like, you know, yeah. 10 pounds, 20 pounds. So That's it's awesome. like, it's awesome. And yeah, so it's been, it's been quite a ride and I hope, and, you know, as we continue this process and, and entering new markets, I think it's going to be just as as we grow going to be an adventure to see how we can bring pt in this in this kind of space to to the masses in a yeah, different way i think um pt i mean pt definitely needs to evolve i think our yeah. current model is broken and yeah. breaking further um you know there's still plenty of pt companies out there that are pushing ahead and they're they're driving they're driving what they're doing but it's not going to last the, yes. in this shape and form it's not going to last much longer yeah we're evolving and i think it's going to be it's important. like i said earlier it's going to yeah. it's going to be some there's be choices right it'll be a, an interesting path to see who it's not going to happen how. overnight that's not yeah. maybe before i die but yeah you know we got well, that's a, already happening mark oh i'm dying what no yeah. i am dying oh, yeah, we're all dying. <laughs> but that's <laughs> but you you are creating the change it's amazing yeah. um right. have you thought about I mean, I'm sure you have. What do you think about automation and how that's going to play a part Oof. in musculoskeletal care? Yeah, I think that there are spaces um, that are undisco- un- undiscovered and unexplored. And so I've, I have a feeling that there will be a lot of push in the space and there will be a lot of response, right? So like as we as we look at AI and as we look at, you know, predictive analytics, as, as, as we look at data mining, as we look at wearables, right? Like this is for, yep. you know, your watch is, yeah, your watch is now for a, a remote patient monitoring, your watch is now a, a, a reimbursable, you're a reimbursable patient for a remote patient, uh, on a, a remote patient monitoring organization, right? So like, as we look at this type of thing, uh, I know the Aura Ring, right? The Aura Ring actually has predictive, uh, uh, their their algorithm has predictive, um uh, uh, predictive analytics, AI, right? Yeah, around, yeah, yeah. Predictive analytics around COVID. They can tell if you're sick right. like seven days before you're sick, 
right? Based on your aura ring stats. So I think that as Did you have we to be get, in the NBA to have one of those though? Uh, I think you no. can order an aura ring, but no. you have to be in the NBA to get in that study, I think. I don't know. Oh, that's but cool. like Mike Eisenhart, Mike Eisenhart's working with uh, Fitbit stuff to do predictive uh, stuff around sure. COVID as well. So yeah. we have PTs that are actually engaging in that space, which is really awesome. Um, and so Mike Eisenhart, I think would be an awesome digital solution person to be on this podcast because what they're doing with the APHPT. No is, doubt. I just wrote yeah. his name down. I yeah. talked he's to him a awesome. couple of times. I'm going to definitely reach out to him. I know. I love Mike. He's awesome. Also Perry Brewbreaker would be good on here too. Um, don't know Perry, but yeah, she's, she's working. They're doing, they're actually doing some stuff with, uh, uh, with, uh, women who, um, are pregnant. And and some high risk maternity stuff with in monitoring, it's, it looks pretty awesome in mm-hmm. content. Um, and so, and then Mark Rubenstein, he actually started a, a direct to consumer. Every time I talk to Mark, I have to I have to go to LinkedIn after the conversation, and either check if I know this person, I've ever met this person, or have ever communicated yeah. with them. And if not, I have to reach out to them. It, yeah. it happens every time we have a conversation. Mark's awesome, and he's no, he's, I meant you. Oh. <laughs> no, Mark. Yeah, Mark Rubenstein is awesome. He's he's up there uh, in New Jersey as well, and he's doing some powerful stuff. So, nice. um, and so they, there's lots of people that are pushing us forward. And when it comes to these yeah. predictive analytics and all this AI, and it's going to be interesting to see how it's woven into our traditional care. Yeah, and and where where there's going to be a breaking point or where there's going to be pushback. Are you are you utilizing any? Um, any automated um not right now no functions right now no it's yeah. all it's all uh one on one human to human care yeah yeah all of our care yeah. is delivered right. via we either async yeah. chat yep right async chat or live or yep. synchronous video i think i think what you what you're doing you know you you you've I mean, you you're changing the model of delivery of care it would be too much to to throw all of yeah. that stuff in at this stage we are doing async awesome. PT exercises. So that's, mm-hmm. that's, you know, so the, our home exercise program is, is not delivered okay. live. Right. So there is that aspect. And that's so, monitored and it can be. Uh, not yet. No, not yet. Well, monitor. It, monitor not, it just, just in terms of like utilization, <laughs> can, can yeah, the PT, totally. right. Yeah, the PT yeah, can, yeah. can see yeah. how. Right. We can look at utilization. We're not. We're not able to see. Like we're not watching people on their camera and stuff like that. That's I pretty. I should cool. hope not. Yeah, Without that's them that's, that's that's a little that's a little too far. So I have a uh, question. So I'm yeah. just fascinated hearing you two talk. But um, what are the challenges, Mark? I mean, you kind of mentioned that you know there's gonna be two different like schools of thought, but also mm-hmm. what are the what are the rea- realities if you know you're trying to convince somebody to come work with you or for you or yeah. even the consumers or investors, like what are the, what are the challenges that you are either foreseeing going through right now, or that you can kind of help people buy into this? Yeah. Uh, so from a patient perspective, patients, I mean, what this past year was our 100 year anniversary as a profession, right? And we spent a hundred years convincing people that they need to come see us in a clinic, right? And that we need to do things with them and to them. And so from a patient perspective, there's a little bit of a resistance. Like, can I do PT digitally? Like, is that going to be effective? Right? Like, so there's a little bit of pushback occasionally from a patient perspective about what we can do and how we can deliver care and uh, the value of what we deliver. I think that's the one of the biggest things. Second biggest thing is technolo- the technology void. If anything that COVID and this pandemic has taught us is that there's actually a larger um, uh, digital a divide with patients and populations that are, uh, you know, minority populations or disadvantaged populations. So there's actually an access issue that we thought tech would solve, but actually been made quite obvious that um, is even worse than we thought. So access to good Wi-Fi or, or internet or uh, cell service, access to tablets and other technology that allows people to be seen in their homes. That's another barrier. So solution solutions around those things are are super important um to make sure that your the tech is easy it's 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 very low bandwidth and um in in very low memory width so it's like it's not taking up a lot of space so solutioning around that has been um i think one of the biggest things and and also payment like a lot of digital health in the digital health space nobody's taking medicaid nobody's taking you know nobody does that right so 
offering actually being able because we we offer pay you know our service to medicaid patients at vori so like actually offering digital care to patients that need it i think um can help with that solution so um that is that you just put two challenges into one scenario that yeah. like really compounds the the, the challenge or, yeah. or the, the complexity of it which is um you're talking about Providing services to patients, patients with Medicaid, who that same patient probably has or potentially has uh, lower level tech. And, you know, so you really like your 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 market really um, uh, obviously you're, you're trying to serve the market that needs the services the most. Right. Um, but it's challenging. But challenging. Yeah. yeah but lo- and also look at Tennessee where they're two hours, two hours outside of the city. It's like. I mean, that's rural. It's like, it's not like Tennessee is Texas flat. I mean, there's a lot of hills over there. So looking at just honestly cell service and it's and, not when he says rural, he doesn't mean like 187th street, Adrian. He yeah. means like really like, I mean like Yonkers. Like, like, <laughs> sure. <laughs> Brooklyn. Sorry. I was Brooklyn. I mean, like to us, sure, right. I mean, he means like deep Brooklyn. Yeah. Uh, yeah deep Brooklyn. <laughs> Yeah, so like there's so I think those are some of the biggest barriers from a from a provider standpoint from getting PTs. I still have PTs that are like, no, I don't believe telehealth is a, is a, an effective way to deliver care. Like they just literally don't think they can do yeah. anything. And I'm I like, call that the um, intellectual divide. Yeah, right. The how does this work? <laughs> right, like I got to get my hands on somebody. Yeah, and so that's still very real. It's still very present. Yeah, and. Look, for those people that spent 20, 10, 5, 8 years, like I, I, you know, I went through an orthopedic residency. I went through a manual physical therapy fellowship. I'm a board certified fellowship, dry needling physical therapist, right? And I still believe and know and have data to support that our, our care can be delivered in a digital environment and patients can get better, right? So I think that's one of the biggest barriers uh, from, a, from a professional standpoint. Um, and also from a from a professional kind of uh, barrier, um, PTs just are not are pretty risk averse. Um, and so they you agree they with like, that, Adrian? Yes. <laughs> okay. <laughs> he leans he leans into the mic. Mm-hmm. Hell yes. Well said. Yeah. Um, and so uh, a lot of PTs are, are are and they don't like change. And so having people kind of take risks and do things differently and like a lot of my time is managing and like kind of recreating what's possible yeah i think i think it's it's i mean to your point i think it's a medical healthcare um issue as well like i was just on a call with the game developers who happen to be medical professionals and um we know one of the things that we came up with was the fact that we are somewhat unicorns and we have to kind of figure out how to bring people along with us because there is going to be a lot of pushback, like you said earlier, kicking and screaming. And I think that's like, you know, we can, we can kind of preach it on the mountaintop. So we have to show them somehow. And it's almost like our response, unfortunate responsibility to prove it, you know, and, and yeah. that whether you believe it or not, it's, it's there, it's, it's going to happen. And I think it's, um, that's the challenge as well. It's like, how do you convince people, um, tackle on this is just a new challenge it's not even the challenge i mean it's 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 digital we all are on digital at this at this form you know so right. well, i think i always think of the adoption curve right the adoption bell curve you got those super early adopters those innovators that are well the innovators that are way out there early adopters are a little bit behind it and honestly like part of me for a long time in the digital space worried about the big hill behind me of what everybody else thought Right. And over the last couple of years, what anything has taught me is that I just need to turn around and look forward and that curve will follow me. Right. And so like that's that's kind of my thought process around it is that, you know, I it's not my job. It's not my it's not my job to convince other people how amazing this is. Right. What my job is, is to show up and create the best, most incredible experience and help people get better right? And help patients get back to life and help patients lift their kids and help as many of those people do that as possible. And so and it's, so, like, it's like the show don't tell, like I've been, I really taken that upon myself, like just show don't tell. Yeah. And I'm really curious to see 
you know, you're in two rural states now, right? Yeah. And then like, I'm curious to see if you expand into, you know, a non-rural state, you know, yeah. and see what yeah. happens, you know, something like Alabama or something like that. Yeah. Pretty <laughs> Arkansas. You know, well, prior to, prior to COVID, um, telehealth utilization was more prevalent in urban areas than in rural areas. Yeah. Um, convenience. convenience. I think that that's it. And, and, and also, and also accessibility. Yeah. Yeah. Accessibility also. I, I, you know, a lot of rural areas, like you said before, bandwidth right. and, you know, not being able to, uh, get, get connected. Um, yeah. but going forward, I mean, you know, I, I, I like that you're starting in those rural areas. Yeah. I mean, that, that is that those are the markets where, where the, where they need the access, right? And well, yeah. there is, was there a reason for those states? I'm just curious. Yeah, because nobody else, like if you look at tech and you look at healthcare startups, everybody's West or East Coast, right? Nobody's here. Yeah, so part of it was with some partners there, so part of it was strategic, but also just like the population that we can serve that nobody else is serving, right? Like, I mean, Uber didn't start in, you know, Nashville, right? Like nobody starts, a, no one's, a, no one started. A Only country music started there. Right. Like, I mean, look where Walmart started, right? Benton, Arkansas, like there's, there's things and opportunities and spaces that people don't really recognize. Um, and it's an opportunity to really work with, um, with people that need access to care, right? Like, I mean, I grew up in Louisiana, so I can speak about the South and the South is not, as we know, in data supports, not the healthiest place, right? If you look at any type of mm. kind mm -hmm. of any kind of demographic data on the South, it's typically that belt along the South that has the highest rates of obesity, diabetes, heart failure, you know, all of the things that kill us early, right? And so arguably, I, you know, that's going to be the needed area to target healthcare change and kind of philosophy around health that needs to be changed the most in this country. That has the, I think the, like, do you take that, you take that pocket and elevate it a little bit or do you take, you know, a super higher end population elevated a little bit, right? Like well, it's, how, al it's also the question of, um, is that low lying fruit or is there, or is there a barrier? Reason. Is there, yeah. is there just a wall that right. you're not going to be able to communicate with some people who are not open to being healthier and they're happy with their lifestyle and their culture and everything about it? Yeah. Um, you know, hopefully with the right message coming from the right people, it will make a big difference. Yeah. And I think that's what we've seen. Yeah. Most people, in the South, med medical interventions and medical interactions are negative. It's always something wrong. You've done something wrong. Why? Why are you still eating that? Why? Just stop smoking. Go walk. You know, it's not. It's not a positive environment for health. Sure. Right. And and so I think the fundamental philosophy at Vori is really meeting that person where they are and supporting them for who they are, where they are, not like being directive, but really using um, that patient and provider therapeutic alliance to create shared vision, shared goals for that patient. So it's a, I, I think for a lot of people going through what we're doing, they're experiencing healthcare differently, um, which, I, which will hopefully evolve to them experiencing themselves and health differently. Does that make sense, Adrian? Like it's, it's, it's when you. Yeah, hundred percent. I mean, I, I grew up, my oldest sister went to Clayton, Georgia. So rural Georgia, so we used to go down for quite a bit of time. I, I went to Texas Tech for four years nonstop, like four times a year. So yeah. I have a special place in my heart for for the South. And I think that's where, you know, my passions lie in entertainment, obviously, but tech and all that stuff. So I think that tech and what you guys are doing is is a very big opportunity to change that. And through just the visual system and 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 just technology, but it's also a challenge, as you said. So yeah. I think I think um, you said like the the, the poor health outcomes in, in, in the South and in the, in the country. I think there's a big opportunity, and I think if you can change that, the next generation can flourish and do better and kind of learn better. And so I think that's, you know, even like you know, I grew up and and you know I grew up very influenced by herbal urban and underserved community, and then also the rural underserved community as well, yeah. and the rural privileged community and the uh, urban privileged community. So I've had an interesting lens of seeing all those things and just seeing like farmers markets pop up. 
nowadays in these communities. I'm just like, oh. Oh. and it's changed. It actually has changed quite a bit. And just yeah. more providers here that represent the people who live here or even in, in, in the South. I think that's really important. So, yeah. you know, speaking the same language, I think it's, it's meeting people where they're at. I think that was the most amazing thing that you said was that I think PTs, we want you to come to our clinic because we're the experts and we have the kind of um, we came doctors and you want to you want to come to us and I think the difference in the digital is that you have to meet in the center or you have to meet them at home. That's kind of a, a different thought mindset. process. Yeah, mindset, mindset, exactly. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I Adrian, you said so many layers there that I think are really. I, I just it it's a beautiful way to communicate, right? Like you you're on every. First of all, not only do we need to meet patients where they are, but your providers need to look like you too, right? So we have, you know, we're at Boy, we're very conscious of that. And like the content that's made out there, I mean, we've talked about this in the past, right? If you look at any exercise library out there, it's just a bunch of, you know, no offense, but just white, middle-aged, typically sports broad women that are that are demonstrating these exercises, or somebody who's super fit, right? Like, and so a lot of people disengage from home exercise programs because it doesn't look like them. It doesn't feel comfortable for them to exercise watching someone who's, you know, got a six pack, you know, and built like a tank doing, you know, external rotation. Like that doesn't, if if there's a non-compute. And so like meeting people where they are on every level, I think is how we need to really truly disrupt and change healthcare. And I love your point about the intergenerational healing that can happen around health. Because honestly, what we're doing now, I, I, I hope that the impact is, you know, a thousand fold in the, in these, in the next three to four or five generations that, that, that we can have an impact that can last much longer than what we, we see as, as humans here today. So I think that's that intergenerational education and knowledge yeah. and safety and acceptance around health is a massive, massive part. Yeah. We're getting close to the end, but a uh, quick question, Mark, yeah. as far as the bandwidth and cell ties and reception, the whole access to, to the waves, right? Yeah. Um, what are you guys doing to mitigate that or what's what's been the workaround or? We're still working on it. Still trying to, uh, you know, you can, the, the video uh, clarity bandwidth can be adjusted, things like that. So there's, uh, you know, we can, we can mess with the, the quality of the video to decrease the, the need. Um, uh, for bandwidth, um, but we're working on ways. Uh, we're about um, uh, we're working on web parity, so you can not just have this on your phone, but you can also have it on your desktop at home. So, uh, also ways that to decrease the need for cell service and having a tab and having a tablet be the only option, um, because there's lots. Of, there's still lots of desktops in the in the south and laptops, and so that's another uh, way uh, that we're trying to solution. Um, but you know, decreasing the amount of synchronous time and and pushing content to asynchronous, which uh, of course takes lo- less bandwidth as well, helps. So, um, content, uh, you know, exercises, things like that are important. Um, and really, in the patient care's perspective, through messaging and through uh, content and information, that really can solve a lot of issues. Right? I mean, it's it's just an information opportunity for patients. They need to. They need. You know, as Jerry Durham always says, it's like if you can help with fear, doubt, and uncertainty, you can help patients navigate space, right? So um, information is key when it comes to patient care. Well, we're going to wrap it with a Jerry Durham quote. That's awesome. Yeah, love it. He's going to love that. He's going to reshare <laughs> this and post tag, it. Take tag, tag Jerry. Um, Mark, as yeah. usual, after every conversation I have with you, I feel smarter. <laughs> So thank you. I've, thank yeah. you. This is awesome. I'm I'm this is a gr- great conversation. Dude, I'm so excited for, for what you're embarking on. What, you're, what you've are you already done is amazing. And what you have in front of you is even more amazing. And I love that yeah. you're, and you have huge ambitions and bold visions of what this is going to be. So uh, we're, yeah. all, we're all eager to see how it all plays out for you. And, you know, and I expect huge, huge things. Yeah. Well, Dan and Adrian, I've, greatly appreciate you guys taking the time to talk to me tonight it's awesome to to what you guys are doing as well like we're all pushing the the growing edges that's what we're doing right like you know we gotta we gotta we have to even though it makes us uncomfortable it makes other people uncomfortable i i think we're all in the path of of doing the best thing we can that we know we can for patient care and 
and help people get better. So yeah. um, I'm definitely not alone in this space and I'm thankful for you guys there too. Awesome. And all the others. So thanks, man. Um, yeah. Thank you. We're going to have to do this again sometime soon. Yeah. And, uh, Six month follow up, something like that. Sounds good, man. All right. Yeah. All right, fellas. Thank you for listening. I hope you enjoyed this episode of the TelePT Connections podcast. You can find Mark Milligan on LinkedIn, Twitter, and at anywhere.healthcare. You can find the TelePT Connections podcast on Spotify, iTunes, Google Podcasts, and anywhere else you listen to podcasts. Please remember to subscribe and leave comments. They mean a lot to us, and they let other folks know to listen too. Thanks again for listening. Next week's guest is a true pioneer in the telehealth PT space, my buddy, Anand Choksi. He's the chief clinical officer at Include Health. You don't want to miss this one. See you then. We hope you learned some things to help you connect with your musculoskeletal system and more. Find us on Twitter at D Seidler. That's D S E I D L E R. And at Adrian M P T A D R I A N M P T. And on LinkedIn, Daniel Seidler and Adrian Miranda. We'll connect with you again next time.